Welcome to Connect This. Oh, I just screwed that up again. <laughs> Kyle, I just love that I have this long relationship with Kyle and that he's just, <laughs> he knows this is me rather than worrying that this is going to be an hour of disaster. We'll pull it together. Exactly. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Connect This. And so today we're going to be talking about marketing and a couple of other issues around uh, broadband. Today is apparently the 25th anniversary of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. So we might talk about that a little bit, uh, but we're going to go around and have some fun. If the pre-chat is any sense, this is going to be a lively, fun discussion. Today we have with us, uh, we have Kim McKinley, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Utopia. Welcome to the show, Kim. Thanks for having me. I always love being here. And... I really enjoy your comments because I feel like for a marketing person, you're remarkably unguarded. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a nice way to say I'm bold. Thank you, we, Chris. <laughs> we, don't, we don't see you just sticking to the bullet points. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> we also have Kyle Hollifield. He was both a senior and vice president of Magellan. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, it's been a lot of years. I have always appreciated uh, your knowledge that you've shared with me. You've been very friendly over the years. Um, and we were just saying eight years now with Magellan, consulting with lots of cities around the country and probably others too. Um, I know you've been working with uh, indigenous groups and all kinds of folks. So welcome to the show. Looking forward to talking about some marketing stuff with you. Uh, thank you, Chris. It's always my pleasure. And then we have our recurring and probably the most um, popular host on the program, Travis Carter. A man whose assets are frozen. <laughs> I came it's, up with that myself. Yeah, it, it's cold here, Chris. <laughs> We're up in Minneapolis. Well, and Chris is in St. Paul. So what is it? Negative two today? So yeah. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. yeah, I was, so what I wrote for myself was that I'm Chris Mitchell from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and I'm really excited to be living in a place where we're waiting for it to warm up so I can go ice skating. That's, that's what life is like up here right now. True, true <laughs> statement. So we're going to have our intro question to get things going. And the intro question is that I, I, I would talk to reporters frequently, right? And lately I've heard from several, well, it sure seems like, you know, the elected officials are getting it now, you know, whether you're talking about a local official, uh, someone in the state legislature, someone in Washington, DC, there's a sense that, well, broadband is really, really important now, which is, which is good. Cause I guess it was only really important last year. Um, and I'm, kind of tired of hearing that it's so much more important when it seems to me a lot of the same kinds of actions we're seeing. And so I just wanted to ask for a quick round, and I'll start with you, Kyle. Um, what would an elected official at whatever level have to do to convince you that they really do think it's important this time rather than they're just going through the motions? Uh, the first thing they have to do is show me that their constituents are really hot about it. Uh, I find that when I had, I find that elected officials that have an area that's really underserved, it is a serious problem for that elected official. And then the next step you see, it starts showing up on the commission's agenda as an issue. Maybe they won't do anything about it, but what happens is those same constituents that are just out there in, with nothing show up. They have no choice. They got, you know, with, I don't have to tell everybody with COVID, we know what's happened with education, healthcare, everything else, mm -hmm. work from home. These, and we have communities, you know, I, I'm doing a community right now, 30%, not 30%, but 5,000 people in one county have no service. Uh, so how do you go forward? Right. So that's, so first is, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. You're, you're going to, we don't want to, we don't want you to take over the, the intro question. I'm just going to go okay. to Kim right. quick. Go right ahead. I, I just want to say one other thing. When it Go shows ahead, Kyle. You know they're serious. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Kyle yeah. just trying to take over my steam over here. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so I think Kyle says it's when it gets on the agenda. I say that we're on uh, work sessions agendas everywhere, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really mean they're serious. So I think it's when they actually start looking into the contracts and what it costs and actually getting it engineered and signing the check. Like nothing says you're serious besides actually moving forward. Because a lot of people, to Kyle's point, will the constituents will go so the lawmakers will have the meeting to appease the constituents well that doesn't mean they're going to go anywhere so sure. sign a check yeah travis you're out there now and since we last talked you are connecting um uh, kids in minneapolis that don't have access and rural folks in wisconsin so um you're doing a lot of new things what is it going to take for government folks to 
um, tell you that they really take it seriously now? Well, I hope there's not a lot of government folks watching, but <laughs> I, uh, in our world, we just kind of need them to process the permits and more or less kind of stay out of the way. Because the question I always have is, what do you want them to do? Have meetings, have roundtables, have discussions, uh, have Zoom calls. You know, until somebody writes a check and picks up a shovel, this problem isn't going to get solved. That's a, I think that's it's a very good question in terms of what do you want to have them do? And I think it varies a lot from place to place. Um, one of the things I do want to see is money. And like, to me, that seems mm -hmm. like a deal. And, that, and that doesn't, in some cases, that may mean municipal investments, which could take a lot of different sides. You know, in other cases, it may just be what we're seeing right now in Arkansas, where um, the state legislators have voted unanimously to send a bill to the governor that would get rid of barriers to municipal networks. Um, and to me, when you're willing to tell AT&T, Windstream, CenturyLink, Frontiers lobbyists to go take a hike unanimously, that's a sign. That's one I like to mm -hmm. see. So, um, Kyle, let's let's continue on with what with what you were saying. Then let's uh, let's take that our first our first agenda point. Do you want to continue that thought? No, I mean no, I, I I agree a lot uh, with what's been said. Obviously, there's no obviously when you actually commission a study, get the cost together, understand if there's a business model to be had, and you fund the first steps. That's obviously the good signs, right? There's no doubt about it. But you got to build consensus. Uh, no matter what we do, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't always work just as an independent consultant or as a consulting firm. I had my own company for 25 years and I worked for state government for, you know, for a number of years. And whether we like it or not, there is a process and uh, you have to go through a process of building that demand. Uh, and so in my, in my opinion, it gets, it gets on the agenda. It comes up for discussion over and over. It's going to take a while. And somebody says, let's fund something. A perfect example is just, uh, uh, just like was said uh, from our friend at Utopia, a perfect example of what she just said was Escambia County, Florida. I Pensacola just, area. Pensacola. I just finished a, a presentation, I mean, a, a feasibility study, put together a great business plan, showed them how it worked. They got 5,000 people with no internet. And they got people downtown Pensacola with less than 25.3. I don't know how that happens, but it happens. Mm -hmm. So guess what? They took CARES money and they said, our first step is unanimously, we're going to take $700,000. We're going to do the design engineering and we're going to start the process. So the check was in the mail. <laughs> they wrote the check. And that process has started, but I would have never got there if I hadn't have built a consensus in the community. And, so, that, and there were all kinds of, I'm sorry, there was all kinds of newspaper articles. There's all kinds of things that push that, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I want to build on that because I feel like as we're going to get into this, one of the things I firmly believe is that what we call the first level of marketing in the early part of a project is education. Like it's like the same, it's like education early and then it turns into marketing later. Um, and I feel like there's, feasibility fatigue it's been building for a while this sense of like why why do you really need to do another feasibility study now both Kyle and Kimberly you both have experience doing feasibility studies and and I feel like Travis might be of the camp who's also kind of like ah, study it to death let's just go out and build something mm -hmm. and so what what really has to be done in early in the process Kim I think you, like you said, I think you can provide these huge feasibility studies, but what do you really need, which as Kyle said, is you need the, the people who want the service. So a lot of feasibility, we just do a survey, a lot of communities, and just do a simple survey without this long, long drawn out year process of, do you want this? That we know they want it, but we just, we have to, but we, like Kyle said, you have to present that demand um, also to the uh, the city officials. So we do a simple survey, we show it to them, we, they can send it out and then we go to the next step pretty easily um, because we don't want to get feasibility fatigue, which I think is absolutely out there. How many feasibility studies have been done and how many projects are actually <laughs> um, in progress? 
More lately. <laughs> more lately. True. True, Chris. I mean, it's exciting. I mean, maybe it's just because there's so many more feasibility studies that have been done lately. <laughs> there's, there's so much going on right now. It's And I mean, now we're talking about Toronto, Boston. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's fascinating to see uh, what might be next. Um, I want to, you know, I, I want to come back to this marketing. I wanted to take, before we dove into it too much, I mean, we just got folks here that want to talk marketing, marketing, marketing. Um I want to get a sense, and I'll talk with you, Travis, first. I want to get a sense. The, the Telecommunications Act is 25. And I recently saw a, um, a thoughtful Twitter thread claiming that the Telecommunications Act was an, basically unmitigated disaster, that it was horrible, um, and um, led to all kinds of media ownership issues. I mean, you got like television stations that are owned by the same company, radios, basically not even a real media anymore because it's been so ruined by corporate America. Um, and so... I took issue with that because I felt like we've seen some good things in the broadband space. Like I feel like it's been a mixed record. And so Travis, you know, your business would not have been possible without that act. And I'm just curious if, if you have some fond feelings toward it because of that. Well, I mean, I guess uh, I'm glad I have heat on in the house. Thanks for that act. But um, I don't know. You know I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but you know, obviously I'm a, pro, a fan of competition and I wonder if that same person would, uh, would question the airline deregulation act of 78 too you know it's the same kind of concept you know where i can't figure out how i can fly to las vegas for 30 dollars right now for minneapolis where back in the 70s it would have been 3200 dollars equivalent so um do i think that it was successful absolutely how many cell companies do we have how many internet companies do we have how many wisps do we have how many you know it's a good thing you know i what what problem are we trying to solve is always the question I have. And I'll just, I'll mention one thing real quick, because we were talking about the government involvement. Not all government is the same too. I have learned in Wisconsin, <laughs> the Minneapolis city council is a very different animal than the uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin council of four people that can get things done. So I've, uh, I've learned quite a bit about this. So when we talk about government involvement, I think it is a little more broad about what you can get. Things we could never get done here, you can get done there at the coffee shop on a Thursday afternoon. So, all right, I'll leave it at that. But well, I'm I've, really I've a fan. Otherwise, I'd have a, I'd have a job today if it wasn't for this act, right? And that'd be <laughs> terrible. Uh, I've, I've spent years talking to you about scale, but I'm glad that your personal ownership has, has gotten it through. And obviously my words have not helped. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, real quick on the feasibility study because I'm a real fan. You know how we do them? It's real complicated. There's 20 houses to the left, 20 houses to the right. You go knock on all the doors. 12 people want it that way. Four people want it that way. Guess which way we go? That way. Because it's, yes. it's, it's banking 101, debt 101. And I think I remember, you know, Kimberly said she had access to some pretty cheap capital, which I'm envious of. All right, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> um, Kyle, 1996 Telecom Act. Is that for me? Yeah. So, um, first of all, I'm certainly not an expert on it. I lived through it, obviously. I was in, I was actually, you know, had a technology company at that time. Uh, it was about a 20 year old technology company was involved in it. It made things much more competitive. It, uh, it, made, my, it made my world much better. Uh, obviously, it, I think it put the absolute finishing death nail in, uh, uh, um, uh, in the, uh, I forget, the, I forget what, what it was called, but anyway, they, they used to be the fairness doctrine. It put the absolute death nail on the fairness doctrine. It was the last thing. That was the last thing. I, I would have thought you'd be liking the fairness doctrine. I do. I'm just saying. Oh, I, okay. Right. Okay. I, I think the 96 really helped nail, kill it. It was already dead under Reagan. And I think 96 really killed it because okay. what happened was you flooded the market, mm -hmm. uh, with all kinds of, uh, communications companies, radio stations, T you know, before newspapers couldn't own TV state, you know how, how, how it worked. So by, by, because there was no fairness doctrine, you could live in a community where 90% of your news came from one frame of mind and you would never see, regardless of which side it was on, you would never see the other side, right? I remember traveling from Tennessee to California and turning on the local channel and going, I've never heard this stuff before. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful point of view. So, so I think that was one of the issues that was a problem with it, but if I could just put a quick perspective, not 68 Carter phone, Supreme Court, big deal, right? Mm -hmm. that, led us, that led us into actually being able to connect phones to the network. 
Right. Saying, this is this is the Supreme Court forcing the Federal Communications Commission to stop being so captured by Ma Bell to and, actually allow other devices on the network that were non-harmful. And and I, sometimes people give credit to the FCC for this, but the Supreme Court forced the FCC reluctantly mm-hmm. to do it. And, and Bill Carter. And Bill Carter. And I, I, I knew Bill Carter very well, by the way. Anyway, so you, you start there in 68. And, and by, by 74, the Supreme Court ruled again that the phone company can't force you to put an interface device between them and the world and charge you more than the phone would have cost you to start with. So that was that, they, they got rid of that interface device issue. And then you, had the, then you had Judge Green breaking everything up, and then we get to 96. So I think it's important to look at it in perspective. We made mm-hmm. leaps and bounds in that 30 years. The, just before we go to Kim for your take on it, I want to make a note because both Travis and Kyle have said there's much more competition now. And some of the folks that are watching this didn't, you know, they weren't doing much in 1996. Maybe they were in high school with me. Um, so I, you know, I have one provider, Travis. You haven't come across the river to my house yet. And it's really easy well, now because the well, river's well, solid. Do you, only, do you only have one provider or do you think you only have one provider? I have one high quality provider that's relevant. And I mean, that's... Oh, well, hang on. But you have, according to the FCC's definition of 25.3, <laughs> you have CenturyLink, Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. Uh, you've HughesNet, got... You, you, HughesNet. You, I mean, so you've got six viable alternatives according to the current definition so that's the snarky answer but what's you know that's the real answer right (laughs) yeah you know now okay all right sorry guys you didn't say you didn't say quality broadband you just said competition chris which i think is a total different play yeah but i mean like there are places i mean i've heard of a place in utah in which there's a lot of competition so yeah so i mean it's working well in some places and it's just so anyway kim let's tell tell us what you think about the the 96 act (laughs) First of all, I wasn't even born in 1996. Just kidding. <laughs> I don't even know what this act is all about. Uh, but I, I don't think there's anything else to say that hasn't been said. I think it really helped um, get to us. I think it helped us have the competition, right? But I don't think w- what we're dealing with today is kind of the result of the 90, 1996 Telecommunications Act, where we have this FCC who's saying that we're covered in areas we're not covered and blah, blah, blah. So I think it had a benefit of bringing more competition to the market, but I also think it has repercussions that of how now we have to actually have quality broadband and not just broadband and competition in general. So one of you is getting notifications occasionally. I'm assuming it's not Travis because nobody talks to him except for me. So I think it's me. I, think it's me. <laughs> I forget Mr. Popularity over there. It's probably yeah. someone trying to. <laughs> He's doing business, I think. <laughs> it's not me. It's all those, it's all those people dealer requests. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here's the other question that I wanted to get to before we dig into marketing more. And that's, um, I'm, I've been seeing more and more folks. And this is part of this issue of muni broadbands growing more and more. You know, you have the, the Boston mayor, can, mayoral candidate, one of the candidates on the city council saying that she thinks they should be doing municipal broadband. Uh, here in St. Paul, um, I've heard rumors that there's folks um, from a couple of powerful places saying, we want municipal broadband. And and I was thinking, well, that's interesting. What do they mean by that? And I, I just feel like more and more, there's a lot of people out there who have done their homework, who know what they're looking for. But I feel like there's also a lot of people who are just like, they see municipal broadband as being this like magic thing. And I'm curious if that's popping up for you. Let me start with you, Kim. Are you, are you, is that one of the things people are coming to you with? Absolutely. I think it's like a keyword. Municipal broadband, isn't that sexy? It's the sexiest uh, keyword in the marketplace. But what does that actually mean? And I think that's what we're seeing between municipal broadband. I hear it with open access networks across the board. What does it mean? And I think it's, do you own the system? Are you the infrastructure of the system? Like they see all these communities around the country that have these, uh, these successful networks. And a lot of government members just don't really understand what it all entails. And a lot of them don't even understand the, their own laws and their own state that a lot of states restrict municipal broadband. Uh, we have a community here in Utah that we can't offer retail services, but is proceeding with retail services. And I'm like, okay, this is gonna be interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's just the key word, especially with this new administration coming in and people seeing the need for it. That, uh, but I think it's what is municipal broadband and how is it defined that we need to really help our lawmakers understand. Kyle? Well, it goes back to I want a pony, huh? <laughs> Everybody wants That was the Los Angeles RFP, I remember from about six <laughs> years ago. Everybody wants a pony. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
You know, what's really interesting about it is uh, from, you know, our perspective is clouded because we deal with it every day. When you talk, when you talk with average normal people out there, if there is any, when you talk to them, they, uh, municipal broadband doesn't mean a lot to them. It really doesn't. I, I think, I think just the opposite is I think we've done a poor job of actually educating the masses. There should be someone in charge of that. Who's doing that anyway? Exactly. <laughs> Come on. So this is my thing, Kyle. If somebody yeah. I'm going on a date with knows what municipal broadband is, I kind of have to run the opposite way. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> I have to for other reasons. My wife won't let me date any longer. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, so so I think I think it's just the opposite is true is, is with the general public. I don't think they really understand what it is. And I think that, uh, you know, when you talk, even when you talk to county governments and city governments, they think they know what it is, but what they really think, what they really know is what they want, not how you get it. What they want is more competition, better service and more coverage. And they really, at the end of the day, don't care how they get it. It's up to us to figure out how they get it. That's, that, that's what I think. No, I think you're right. And I think one of the things that we talked about previously on a show of this was open access. And when I look mm -hmm. at Toronto, um, when they're talking about municipal broadband, it's very clearly an open access kind of arrangement mm -hmm. using municipal assets. That's what the New York uh, Internet Master Plan was. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's what Boston would be moving toward. Um, I mean, those are the things that make sense is, is I feel like, you know, looking at someone like Travis and saying, um, if I could marry two thoughts earlier, hey, you can borrow money at 2%. Um, you mm -hmm. know, why don't you build fiber and lease it to me so I can expand my network more rapidly, um, whether that's on a on an exclusive or a non exclusive basis. That's and to me, I mean, I still I, I'm, I don't want to sit here and, and say that one model is better than another because it depends on the facts of the community. But but I'm, I think that's the direction we're heading in. Mm -hmm. well, what, what are communities really good at? Infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. Water, power, streets, roads. Mm -hmm. A broadband network, I think Travis would agree, is an infrastructure project. Mm -hmm. That's why you can bond it for 20 years. So let's let the people that know how to do infrastructure do the infrastructure, and let's let the people who know how to do services do services. Mm -hmm. And I think ah, the there, there, there is a big difference, though. Yes. The water and electricity have been around forever and ever, so the current people are just operating the networks. They aren't the people that are building them. Yeah, and I mean, every single election cycle, I get called down to city hall to go through all the prospective people trying to get reelected, telling them what we're going to do so that they can put it as their bullet point on their talking sheets. And you know, the next time I hear from them, the next election cycle. Right, so, Travis, I think that's what you like, you, Travis. You, yeah. yeah, I'm like Travis. You seem thrilled to be doing that every election cycle. Oh, I just, I just already know it's going to be happening, mm -hmm. and then of course they're going to throw in all the buzzwords of the year, and you know that that they have in their, in their, in their that I don't even understand what the heck half of them are talking about. But at the end of the day, it's what can they do to help? I think that's the ultimate question. So yes, I'm, I, I agree with Kyle. That, you know what? They do a great job running the sewer and the water, but they're not. They didn't build it. They're maintained. Well, let's 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 be clear though. I mean, with the electric systems, there's 2,000 municipal electrics. There's significant changes going on right now, and they are rebuilding the system. And so, you know, I feel like that's. Ah, but, but but touch on this. If they're if you don't deliver the electricity to Kyle's point, what do you have? You'll have a mutiny on your hands. I think we're getting there with internet yeah. service too. Yeah. Well, you are, but it's it's. The, the problem is, is if when you talk to people, and this is when we'll probably get into the marketing piece, what's maybe good, not good enough for us is good enough for most people out there. Remember, I still have 2000 people in Minneapolis that use dial up modems since 1995. See, yeah, I'm less with than you, Kim, look at city. Kim's facial expression. Exactly. But to <laughs> me, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to the marketing stuff and, um, Let's see. The first thing, there's a lot of things I want to come up with. Um, I want to, I want to come back around to some of the fun marketing stories, but let's not start there. Let's just talk about this. Like what are the biggest challenges? And, and it doesn't just have to be municipalities, but what are the small ISPs? You know? Um, so I feel like, you know, companies. <laughs> Hang on my car extended warranty. Hold on a second. <laughs> 
I've been waiting for this call for weeks. Chris. Yeah, of course they call now. <laughs> they sent you notices in the yeah, mail. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the I have to say this is the worst connect us connect this. I don't even know what show we're doing. Um, for for interruptions, <laughs> it's just hilarious. Usually, I have unpopular people on who don't want to get no one's talking to them. I guess. Um, the what is the challenge? What is the biggest challenge that a small ISP faces um, in terms of of uh, of doing this work well? Um, Kyle, let me throw it to you first. Uh, capital. Money to do marketing? Money, capital. And that's because there's not enough money or they just don't correctly allocate it? No, a small ISP, uh, it, this is a capital intensive investment. It's like building an automobile. It's very expensive to build these networks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so I think capital is the, is the number one thing. Well, I mean, that's why anytime there's any kind of government grant, just look at the people that apply for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think I asked, I think, I think I wasn't totally clear in the question. I mean, more like from a marketing perspective, not in terms of like actually building the whole network and everything. If you just look at the challenge, I mean, let me put it this way, Kyle, you've studied this as much as anyone. I think the number one thing, if you wanted to fix most of the municipal systems that have really struggled, the number one thing you would fix probably has to do with their marketing plan. Do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you do it, if you do it right, there, you should be the lion's share of the business if you do it right. There's just no, there's just no doubt about it, but you have to do it right. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't say, I will build it. I know they'll come. No, that's not the way it works. You have, that's to, the, earn, you have to earn that's, it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the field of dreams marketing plan. Yeah, exactly, Kimberly. Exactly. <laughs> and so, Kim, would you agree with that? I mean, you've also looked at, you know, why some municipalities have struggled. And um, would you say marketing is, I mean, it's a weird question because like, I feel like, yes, the thing I care the most about is obviously the biggest problem. <laughs> exactly. I am the most important employee at Team Utopia because of this reason. Um, absolutely. But I also think that it's, I mean, I think that capital from a marketing or like capital from a marketing perspective is important, but you don't have the skill set and they don't have a lot of, a lot of these small ISPs don't have somebody they can hire for marketing. So one of the biggest mistakes I see is that they think, that an office worker can come in and do a marketing plan because it's social media or you write a Facebook post. Well, there's a lot of like science and statistics and watching what's happening. And they just, they don't know what they don't know. People who build these networks usually hire, hire technical people and they don't hire people like myself who's like, okay, so let's look at the, the competitive dynamics in the market. How are we positioning ourselves? Yeah, I, I, but I think it does come down to a small ISP too. How are they going to afford a $70,000, $50,000 employee for just marketing purposes? Because they don't view it um, the same as at least I would hope Kyle and I view it. Maybe even Travis. So Travis, how, how have your marketing, have your marketing approach changed over the years as you've had more money? Well, it's changed, but it's I think Kim was spot on that you take a bunch of techie nerds and you put them in a room and they can't quantify the results of a dollar in marketing directly to a dollar in sales. It's challenging for them to understand, uh, you know, where the value proposition is. I mean, the value proposition is huge, huge, but then you also have with a small business to what Kyle said, you know, if your budget is, I don't know, let's say you're able to accumulate a few hundred thousand a year in capital to do infrastructure improvements, are you going to spend 25, 50, 100,000 in marketing, or are you going to put more fiber in the ground or more radios on towers? It's, it's a choice. And I think it's a sad choice. And I see ISPs do this all the time is they always leave the mar sales and marketing mm. to the very last priority. Mm. And it should honestly be one of the very first priorities. And yes. So to answer your question, we have significantly changed and appreciate the the mark sales and marketing piece involved in in running the business on um there's a a bench for the the bus company the bus company the metro transit the the in minnesota here um wow words are struggling with me today um over by oh. uh well, the lake that used to be called calhoun is now called uh, macabre um something 
I should remember how to say this. Um, I remember it better in the summer when I'm going there frequently. Um, anyway, you had a billboard, not a billboard, but a, a big thing there that was like, it was like this hilarious marketing campaign. I felt like Travis for over many years and then it disappeared. And I'm just curious, like, did you change the way you did marketing? Well, when we, when we get to a saturation in an area, we will, we tend to reallocate those dollars into the new construction areas. So after we've been in a certain region or a certain area of town for three years, we will lighten up a little bit on the marketing. So it's, a, it's another interesting problem we have because we don't cover the entire city. You have to be more strategic in your marketing approach. You can't get on the traditional marketing campaigns because what you'll end up doing is you'll end up generating a lot more calls and frustration from customers that can't get your service than customers that can. So yes, we, we, we kind of move our dollars around each year on where our, where our main build is happening. So Kyle, let's ask about that. When you're, when you're starting off a build, how do, you do, how do you market in when you need to do something? But again, um, and we ran into this when we were just studying the three networks that are being built in the, the front range area of Estes Park, Loveland, and S, um, Fort Collins, the big one. Um, and so what, do you, what, do you, what, what recommendations do you have when you're early in the build as to how you market? Well, <clears throat> the first part of that is branding, right? So who are you and what do you do? That's if you don't know who you are and what you do, and the whole company doesn't understand who you are and what you do, then you're going to have, you're going to struggle out of the gate. So what does that mean? Like, I mean, so let's just let's dig into that for a second. Cause like, I mean, Hey, we're here to provide great internet access. Boom. That's what we do. Like, <laughs> is that good enough? No, it's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> How does that set you apart from anybody else? Right. Okay. So what we're really here to do is provide the absolute best quality of service we can provide the best value proposition. Right. Uh, and, and the, and the, and the best uh, utility of goods and services that we can provide. And that means all through the process. You know, when, when, I ran, when I ran actual on the ground marketing and we would have company meetings every week, I'm sure that Kimberly goes through this. Mm -hmm. And when it was my turn to talk as on the board of directors, I always stood up and I said, everybody that's in sales and marketing, raise your hand. If anybody that didn't raise their hand, you don't get a paycheck. <laughs> because we're all here in sales and marketing. I don't care what it says on your title. I don't care what job you do inside the company. At the end of the day, your job is sales and marketing. And here's what I mean. Every touch point with a client, with a customer, is an opportunity to pass or fail. Every touch point. It doesn't matter if you're calling the knock. I don't care if it's the guy outside in the truck. I don't care if it's the guy on the pole. I don't care if it's the CEO at the uh, Chamber of Commerce dinner. The issue is every touch point is a chance. So you have to build a culture inside the business first that understands who it is and why they exist. That's number one before you even approach the market. So that is the first steps that I would do. That's, I think that was really good, especially at the end. I mean, really helpful. I had this snarky response that I'm still going to use at the beginning, which is like, totally <laughs> sense. So just... I want to, I want to put this to Kim, right? So, so, you know, Kyle says like your brand is to provide the best service and this and that. And whoa, it whoa. Reminded me... my music, <laughs> did it, did my music just, just start on? No, no one else can. Why? I think it's an imagine, oh, imagining things. Aretha Franklin just started popping up in my ear just now. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people associate the word respect with me. So that's not too surprising. <laughs> um, so while we're on the pop culture reference, I just had this sense. Kyle is talking about the branding. And I'm just reminding myself of uh, the history of the world part one. Mel Brooks trying to get his uh, unemployment check as a, as a stand-up philosopher. And, and the woman is asking him what his job is. He says he's a stand-up philosopher. And she says, oh, a bullshit artist. <laughs> Can so, you see that on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you probably could dig that up. I remind you that philosophy breaks no bread. That's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so, I mean, let's, 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 for someone who comes at this critically, like, like this, what, what about branding really matters? So Kyle's points about like every touch point, that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like a logo and the words around it. Like to me, honestly, like I just, I feel like that's a little bit of a fluff and people pay too much attention to it. Am I wrong about that? about branding. I think yeah. brand, branding is a huge part of what we do. And so I, I hear what Travis said. It's like, we, you're strategic of where you go, 
But the reason that we've grown into a lot of cities that we have is because of our brand um, that's been out there. So, so Travis, when like he's doing it into strategic areas, we used to do that too, where only somebody can get it. That's where we would go and market. Now we flood the market with Utopia everywhere because we want that brand. So when it's top of mind, when a city leader or anybody else wants to start thinking about who they choose for a partner, they know Utopia. And it's not necessarily about selling it. One of the biggest reasons we've gotten to some of the cities we have is because people are like, we know the Utopia brand. So can you get Utopia? And it's not even they're like, is it Utopia or municipal broadband? But they, they almost are like using the whole Kleenex reference. We want Utopia. <laughs> And I, I, I think it's vitally important, so although this is a marketing person saying this. So, I mean, but this is, this is actually like the canonical example, right? Your name was as bad as it could get in a lot of yes. spheres. Yeah. How, what, so did marketing and brand change that? Or did the fact that you started providing the best service in Utah change that? I mean, obviously there's, there's going to be some mix, but how do you answer that? I would say it's, a, I mean, I would say it's definitely a combination. I think that we had to do, go back to what Kyle said and we had to start proving at what we said um, by delivering the best service, by starting to market so people even knew who we were. Um, but then we had to start doing PR to say, hey, we've changed ourselves. Like you don't know this because if we just did marketing and not the PR and some of the branding efforts, I don't think anybody would have really even known um, the story of Utopia. And I think one of the biggest parts of marketing, especially in this industry, is being disruptive and being transparent with your story. Um, because if we had come out, there was stories back in the day of, do we change the Utopia name? And I said, just like another big incumbent who changed it to another name, but everybody knows who that incumbent is. <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense. Own your brand, own your story and say, we've changed. And I think that gives you more credibility in the marketplace. You know, I'll say this. I, um, I don't know that everyone always recognizes the name changes. I mean, I hear people being like, oh, I used to have Comcast and that sucked, but now I have an Xfinity and that sucks. Or this is <laughs> the spectrum. So it does fool people. But at the same time, like if they still have a crappy experience, they have a crappy experience. Like, but this is where I wanted, one of the things I wanted to, to Travis to talk a little bit about, um, if you're willing to share some of the secret sauce. I think when I hear about what new customers go through, and I've heard it from some of the customers and I've heard it from the way that you think of it, Travis, the the first time you have that touch point with them from like when their service turns on, it seems to me that you're, you're obsessed with trying to make sure that they're having a good experience. Um, and I'm just, what, what goes into that as you're thinking about that? I think Kyle touched on it a little bit. You know, the um, culture that we've tried to establish is be the customer. How would you want to be treated? How would you want the experience to go and try to design a situation like for me, I can't stand those when you have to like press one for this, two for that. And you end up, I had to Google the word conical. You said it, so I had to, what it meant. So anyways, you know, so you have this, you had this sieve down and you end up at the same person, right? So you, you push 50 things, um, easy month. You know what our number one thing is easy, easy monthly billing. You know, you don't play a bunch of service games and fees and overages and all this kind of nonsense. You just be the customer. You know, if, if you're going to get a bill, that's what it's going to be. And if there's a problem, I think my re the record right now is I had a $25,000 basement repair I had to do for a homeowner because uh, we bored into their basement on accident. You fix the problem and you move on. A lot of companies would be like, that's not our fault and walk away. And as soon as that hits social media, you're dead. So own, be the customer, own, own the experience, monitor your, inner, your next door ratings, your Google star ratings, and you will be amazed what a $20 Starbucks gift card does to solve somebody or just to call them up on the phone. I mean, I'll call one or two people a week and say, hey, wasn't a great experience. I apologize. I take ownership for the problem and get it fixed and follow through. It's all, it's all you have to do. Hey, don't, no. tell any, don't tell anyone. This isn't that complicated, this customer service thing, you, but no, nobody seems to want to do it. But you also go through this, don't you have your, you have parts of your team go through the install process like over and over again, like so they yep. they know exactly how it's working. Yep, perfect it. You know, uh, notifications, making sure you let them know you're coming. Nobody, have you ever had that? I'm, gonna, you know, the somebody's going to deliver something between noon and four, and they show up at like nine at night. I mean, we've all had that, right? It's just you know, respect the people, and I don't know. It's it's just being trying to try to stay on top of it, and it's every day. 
It isn't mm -hmm. just do it for like an afternoon and then move on. It, you have to build it into the culture of the business. And that, with that being said, Travis, you have to have contractors who believe in your mission statement on that, that customer service and not just your employees, because we have yeah. contractors yep. who believe yep. it's entrenched in everything they do as well. Yeah. And I'm, and again, and I don't have some huge, you know, organization. If there's a problem out at a house and Rick did the job, I'm calling Rick up, tell him to get out there and fix it now. I don't care what you're doing. And off he goes, you know, but know all your people, you know, I'm on first name basis with all of our contractors, you know, it's hard to remember them all, but you, you, you try, you know, and you build that rapport because they are ultimately representing the business. I feel like it's one thing to say all these things, but it reminds me of a conversation that Kyle and I had a while back. And Kyle, you described your job as running through walls, um, trying to uh, break down the limits that, that your bosses were putting on you because you wanted to do some of these things and they would maybe didn't see the value or they just thought it was inconvenient to do something different. Well, exactly. So that's, that, that's the passion that comes with that with, the, with your culture, right? And you can't build that culture inside the organization if leadership don't want you to go there. So you've got to you've got to you've got to force that issue. And you know what happens? I think especially in municipal broadband, uh, because of the way government works. And 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 by the way, uh, you had a great you had a great thing about there's different types of government and different levels of government. You're absolutely right. Um, but because of the way it works it's very hard for them to understand what the average person goes through. And I, I think it's really, really important that you, you have that passion to the average person. I mean, it was not just, just like was just said, it was nothing for me to get on a phone when there was a problem and talk directly to the customer, nothing at all. There was nothing more important for me that day than to fix a problem. If it had to be fixed now with really, really large companies with 27 million subscribers, they say, well, I can't do that. That's not true. You can do that. You just don't want to do that because why there's an extra one tenth of 1% profit. If I do it a different way. Okay. Well, I believe that if you get the churn rate down and you don't have such a high churn with customers, you no, make that no, no, don't tell them this. Don't tell them this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is for, for all the folks out there from charter spectrum and AT&T, it is absolutely vital. They save as much money as possible on their customer service. That is <laughs> definitive. <laughs> You think I'm going to be able to change that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's I, be I believe in you, Kyle. I believe in you. <laughs> you can change anything. <laughs> well, I don't know about you guys. The other thing we did is I got, I got out of this whole model of sitting on the phone with people for hours and hours and hours trying to walk them through. You know, we, we would spend in the beginning like two hours on the phone with some non-technical person trying to help them. When I swear to God, they live like three miles over there. So we just get in the car now and drive over there and help them out in person. You know, it's, it, it just, it works so much better than. Than anything. And I would agree with that, Travis, except they don't want me to help with them with their technical issues. Um, but yeah. we, um, yeah. what, what, what we'll do is like, I give my customer service the power to, um, to waive truck roll fees if yeah. they think they need to and enable your customer service team to take care of the customer without going through this. You need to go to the retention department. You need to go to this department, like yeah. end it on the phone. I tell my team every day when somebody calls in for a router issue and they're like, it's the same question. And I said, but it's the first time they called. Mm -hmm. So treat them like it's the first time they called because yeah, if you, you were you on the other line, truck rolls? we do charge for truck rolls. We're how's fancy that? over here in Utah, mm, I guess. How does that work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, because the thing is, we're going to get, I mean, we're, we'll have people, our network is over 200 miles long. We'll have people who call in every day. But one, some of the things we do to mitigate like speed test is before we leave an install, we take a speed test and mm. we record it um, to make sure that they were actually getting the speeds because how many, because we don't provide routers um, or anything okay. of that nature. So um, they could have a, a router from the, the dial-up dages from 1996 and trying to be doing a gig on it and this trying to also, convince them. <laughs> this is also the difference perhaps between an open access network and yeah. a retail service provider. There's, That's true. There's, yeah, there's well, a more it's, of a it's interesting network. you bring that up because Chris and I have had that conversation numerous times. We're actually not in the internet business. We're in the speedtest.net business. <laughs> and, it, and as long as the little bars go where they're supposed to, they're perfectly happy. So. <laughs> 
Speedtest.net must be a really popular site because before I got into this business, I never went to speedtest.net. <laughs> Everyone gets their shiny new internet and that's the first thing they do. And yeah, their 1995 Linksys router that they bought at Goodwill doesn't work. It's our fault. So yeah. Kim, you said earlier about this being something that so many folks feel like they can just like, oh, just bring in an intern to do some social media posts. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to I want to get into some of the segmentation types of things to think about the market differently. And I'm I'm guessing I mean, one obvious way is just small business versus other kinds of enterprise versus residential customers. But but how do you conceive of your your potential customer base? Do you how do you break it up? I mean, you, you just named it. We basically do residential, small business, and enterprise uh, business. And how do we market to those uh, different segments? Because a small business is mimics a residential customer, except, first of all, they're probably going to pay more, and <laughs> they don't understand the internet. But an enterprise business, you don't need to tell them what a router is. You don't need to go in and do the full install. Um, but it is different of how you approach each of those customer bases. Kyle, I feel like you were for a while the the reigning U.S. champion of getting small businesses on your network. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm curious, I mean, one of the things that, that I feel like people don't often realize is telephone service really goes a long way, like a really good telephone service because businesses have to answer telephones often. But but what are other key things to think about to make sure that your your services are going to be really well received by small businesses? So first of all, um, in my case, we, we approach small business as small business to small business, not as this big, you know, utility that's going to do you a favor and bring you something. So we had a small business department, basically, that only dealt with small business, not enterprise, because we used our major account reps directly for enterprise. They expected that and needed that type of service because they're getting one, 10, 40 gig, whatever, whatever it was. Uh, plus, they were getting telephone and, uh, and in some cases, even video. Um, on the small business side, uh, our approach was simple, easy. Everything is done turnkey for you. All you got to do is sign this piece of paper and make your payments. Everything else is done. So we kept it very, very simple. In other words, I'll give you a, a good example. If you want a VoIP for us, we pre-programmed your VoIP switch at our facility to mirror your, the current switch you had in your office. We brought it there, set it up and trained you and we never had to reprogram it. So many times I saw people struggling with a small business that had maybe 10 lines or five lines or it was and seven phones. They went from a traditional landline type system, rotary dial or touch tone dial uh, to a VoIP system. And we would set the VoIP system up to look exactly what they had. Why make them relearn something? Let's just give them a better technology at a better price. So one of the things that we did, we customized as much as we could for every small business, whether, whether it was on the internet side uh, or whether it was on the voice side. And I, I think that made a, it became a partnership almost because they would just, they would just, they would just call you for anything at that point. They didn't even get price checks anymore. Like, hey, just come do this. Add me five phones. I don't care. I know when I get it, I don't have to worry about it. So I think that was a big, a big, a, a big way to do it for us. Is that spike anything in, interesting thoughts from Travis or Kim? I think it's interesting um, from our perspective because we are an open access network, and on the residential side, we are very all like inclusive. Like we go out and do the whole install, like Kyle just mentioned. On the small business, it's like some of our ISPs on that side don't want us to be that. Um, hands on. But, and one thing that I will say, because I'm so successful at my marketing, a lot of people don't understand we're government and how we work either <laughs> when they call up. So a lot of small businesses get confused where we do really well with enterprise who understand the wholesale model a lot better. Right. But I, I love, I love Kyle's approach on that. And I think it's the right way to approach a small business. Absolutely. Travis, what do you do on small businesses? So very similar to Kyle, we, we control the end-to-end -end experience. We, we find that um, if they get super frustrated out of the gate and it's a bad turn-up experience, it's very hard. It's kind of like a bad first date, right? It's hard to you know undo that and, and get a second. So we, we try to really control the entire end-to-end -end experience. But it's actually very interesting. 
the differentiation between a single family home and even an enterprise technology anymore isn't like it used to be, you know, it's all ethernet at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, sometimes I find the enterprise customers are actually more difficult to work with, with the same exact technology than a single family home is. So it's, it, you kind of take it case by case. Kyle, have you, or Travis, have you been hearing my first, bad first date experiences? Is that what you, why you mentioned well, that? I, I, yeah, well, you, you mentioned date and I'm like, wow, it's been a long time, but you know, I've had plenty <laughs> of bad ones and you, you, tend not, you, you tend not to have a second one. So this is, this is the bonus material for the paying exactly. subscribers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, the other theory we always had was everybody works somewhere. So if you have a really good positive experience with your home turn up internet experience, mm -hmm. there is a high, high, high probability that when there gets to be an opportunity to, for you to bring internet to their business. Now, again, this is pre COVID days where now everyone's at home, but um, we had about a 95% success rate bringing connectivity to their business without even trying. And I'll, I'll say this also, something that Travis has found is that um, buying me Buffalo wings is a good investment for um, positive social media reviews and things like that. That's how bad my dating life is, just so we're clear here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, yeah. good to know, Travis. Good yeah, to know. Yeah, Travis, yeah, who yeah, has yeah, a yeah. wonderful I don't have a lot life. of choices these days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he eats them and runs. That happened last time, so... <laughs> Uh, like no, no, you know, it, you know, what's nice about it is because it is a universal technology now, you know, mm -hmm. Kyle, you remember back, you know, we had X25 connections and D oh, yeah. DS3s and all these different alphabet soup. Yep. Now yep. it's a, now it's an ethernet jack click and it's all, it drains the same. Yeah. If you, nice. if you, ever, if you ever programmed a channel bank, you would understand. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kim, Kim doesn't remember that because she was born in 1998, apparently. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for remembering that, Chris. <laughs> so I want to ask Travis, one of the things that you did is you really went after your competitors sometimes. I think you had billboards with like the salaries of their CEOs and things like that. Well, um, it was, yeah, it was a cute marketing idea. I'm not sure necessarily how well it resonated with people, but I liked it um, uh, <laughs> because in, in the beginning, you know, when you're just starting out, which I think is a common problem, we talked about the capital needs, but you know, now you're talking about, you have a new name, nobody's heard of, uh, we were talking about fiber, which nobody had really heard of at the time. And so we're out there trying to educate people and on a better mousetrap, you know, under, under capitalized to do it. So you kind of had to take the, oh, the best shot you could at the time, you know, and try to be as creative as you possibly could to try to get the most impact. So yeah, we, we tried everything under the sun to, to get our messaging out there. And would you say that it was a morale builder for the office? Do you have competitions to come up with some of that? Yeah, but then the city yelled at me for a while, you know, for a few of them, you know, so some of them, we went a little over on the edge. Some of the, some of the young ladies were a little too risque for billboards, I guess. So yeah. Yeah. Live and learn. Right. You know, hell, I wasn't a marketing person. I see the thing is I couldn't afford a marketing person. So you, <laughs> had, to kind of, you had to kind of wing it. Right. And then it was actually, ironically, it was last year, year before last, we were in a room with all these marketing professionals and they were talking about actually branding and all of this, you know, bringing a campaign to market. And I'm like, huh? And, and I thought it was a bunch of nonsense, to be honest with you but it was the smartest move we ever did at the end of the day. It was really well done. You know, we have a great brand now. We have a voice. You ever heard of a voice? I mean, that's some marketing term I'd never What's heard that? of before. And, you know, your mission statement and all these things. But it, it's good. It lines everybody up and you, and you can kind of march in the same direction, which is really, really, I've learned a lot from it. And, and so you thought you thought it was all BS when you first got all those marketing people in a room. Oh, is what yeah, you're I didn't, you know, I, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what do you do. You just throw a logo on a screen and start selling internet. No, but you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. But I was open-minded enough to, 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 to go through the experience and, and it ended up being money well spent. Now, with the rebranding, you have this really clever thing. You had been U.S. Internet, which at one point was short for United States Internet, right? No, we thought we were a big deal, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but now you call it unbelievably simple Internet, which yeah. is clever. And that wasn't me. That was a very smart young lady that came up with that. And um, a, a logo is just it was simple. You know, USI is what we ended up calling ourselves. And it's simple. People understand it. It's an acronym. It's got a cute little smiley face. So it makes people feel good when they see it. Again, there was a lot. It doesn't look like much, but there was a lot of process to get there. 
So as we wrap down, I want to I want to get a sense, Kyle. First of all, is there anything that we missed that we should talk about? But also, what are, what's a really fond memory that you have? I just like digging into your experiences, which are myriad and fascinating um, uh, regarding um, marketing, uh, whether it's at one of the your clients or one of the places you work directly. Oh, man. It's, wow. That's a tough question, Chris. There's, there's so many of them. Uh, we don't have that much time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, you know, um, I think I think probably one of the one of the better ones was we were doing a community in Ohio, and was, they were going to be municipal broadband, and they had a big clock in the center of town. It's in a town. It was a big tower, and so we said, "How do we how do we build some demand around this?" And so the center of town at that point, there's no COVID, obviously. Uh, every weekend was a big deal. They would have car shows and it was just a big thing for the city in Ohio. So what we did is every night at 10 o'clock when the town started to, or before the town closed down, people at home, all of a sudden we'd had this big light that came on and it said coming July 7th, 2018. That's all I said. This went on for three or four months. And this became a big thing in town. I mean, a big thing. The newspaper, and we made a pact among everybody. We are not telling anybody what this <laughs> means. We're not doing it. And it just kept building momentum and building momentum and building momentum. And pretty soon it was like, we have to know. It was like, we will be firing up our first fiber optic customer on July the 8th. And here's the community we're going to. Who's going to be first? Get in the pool now. And it, we did that for like about three months and the, it just incredibly ignited the town. So when we rolled it out, it was like people standing in line. So I thought that was a, a, kind of a clever way of doing it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Kim, got the same question for Best you. Best story. Um, I think like the thing I would say to end this whole conversation is always be agile of what you're doing in the marketing aspect because people will say to you, well, we have this great campaign and they let it run for four years. Um, and don't think you are, you're too smart. Um, always listen to the youngsters who, like myself, who was born in 1998, of what <laughs> new, new platforms are coming out there. Because one thing we tried last year was a social media influencer, if everybody knows what that is on this panel. And we did a video with him and it got 700,000 views around the world. Wow. Well, um, I mean, around yeah. the world may not be that helpful for you. <laughs> it isn't, but it gets the story around, right? Because mm -hmm. our plot, I mean, we're government. We just want everybody to, to work, but we got calls from Alabama. Like my team is like, could you just pull this video? Because we're so sick of people talking about it. But mm -hmm. it was really good to understand that going back to branding, Chris, and why branding is important. <laughs> and, and especially as Utopia um, looks to venture outside of the state of Utah as well. So, um, but no, it's, it's just be agile, be happy. I've been doing this. I, I always say, Chris, and you've heard me say this, I started into uh, Utopia in 2010, right when it started turning around. So thus, it's my responsibility that Utopia has turned around. Only me. Yeah, exactly. Right. But and, there's, yeah, go ahead. And the success is proportional to the width of the radius of your glasses. So exactly. I'm looking forward to soon. Growth. <laughs> soon there'll be cl clown glasses but yeah it's it's the the stories just stay like it's harder than you think from a marketing perspective just stay the course and have fun with it at the end of the day it's just oh and this i industry, you're, this industry is fun your point is actually i mean it reflects something you said earlier too which is that you know if you're getting Seven hundred thousand views around the world. Like it does put a spotlight on you in ways that mm -hmm. sure some might be future clients who want you to bring open access to Alabama, but um, but it's also it creates a demand locally where there's a different kind of respect. I mean, this is something that when I was talking with folks ten years ago in Lafayette, Louisiana, they would talk about because we would talk about all right, you're building this fiber network. What are the benefits? And you know, you can talk about money saved for the utility. You can talk about lower prices from competition. This and that. They said, you know, it's it's nice knowing that that people in England are jealous of us. Like there's a pride there for a community that wasn't previously on the map, um, you know, putting itself on the map like that. There's real benefit there. Yeah. Um, I had a call with somebody in Germany the other day and saying our broadband is terribly slow here. What can we do to help? So I, I think it is about us being a small industry and helping each other out too. 
So the last thing that I want to say, and we'll see, I mean, we can, if anyone wants to comment on it, that's fine. But Travis, Travis, sorry. Don't want to get your hopes up. It's actually a question for Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, one of my favorite stories of your marketing over the years is that working for BVU at the time, you were saturated in the market. Like Travis was talking about earlier in some places, like it's just, you know, at a certain point, like you're not really trying to get new customers. And so you talked about how one of the things that you did was you sponsored um, like uh, football soccer cleats for kids uh, for that were, that were low income. And just walk us through why that was a smart move. Well, because it really, it really talked about what the culture of the company was itself, right? We, we are the community. You know, FAN stands for fanatics. We wanted our fans to be fanatics. I mean, you're probably a Vikings fan. I don't know. Eagles. Maybe. Yeah, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so okay. yeah. So, yeah. So there's a reason you're an Eagles fan. I don't know what that is, but for some reason, at some point, it was triggered in your life to be an Eagles fan. So when we did those kind of community outreaches, like, Cleats for Kids was a program. Every kid that couldn't afford cleats that was going to be part of a sports program, we we're going to provide them cleats, okay? What happened was their family became a fan of BVU. Real simple. So when the guy from the competition knocked on the door and says, we got a promotion, they said, we don't care. We don't care. So what, so what we did is dove, we dove very deeply into the community and said, where are the needs and how can we take excess revenue as part of a marketing campaign? And it was a pure, pure marketing campaign. And how can we also leverage other providers? For a good example is uh, we provided video. ESPN was one of the networks, right? ESPN had a deal that no matter who you are, if you get so many, so many subscribers, they give you so much money for promotion, for advertisement. We would take that money. It didn't cost us anything and we would move it to the local community. We didn't put it in the bank and say, this is part of our profit. What we did is said, no, that's key, that's cleats for kids. Or are, are, are we also things like we would partner with the Lions Club, glasses for kids. It, it, the point is we, we wanted to make fans. We wanted to make fanatics out of our customer base. Excellent. 